Eggleston House. This is again, as we've talked about, up in the center. The farmers had great farms outside of town, and as they grew elderly and unable to care for the farms, they would pass them on to their children. They would then move into town and build uh, houses in town and spend the rest of their life uh, in the centers of town. So let's go ahead and start. The first major brick uh, structure built in uh, Aurora since the Eggleston house up on Eggleston Road, which was built in the 1830s. So uh, we didn't have much brick building in our town other than for chimneys and things. But Frank Creek, this is the third establishment on this site uh, that, uh, that served as a store. The original one was opened by uh, Ebene well, the, an Ebenezer Sheldon, not the settler Ebenezer, but his grandson, uh, about 1840. Uh, it uh, was a thriving operation. He sold it. Uh, it, uh, later, it was struck, it was not struck by lightning, but it burned down. And a house was moved from down there, up here, uh, that became the second shop that was here. Uh, Frank Treat bought the land, and they didn't want, as, we, as we've talked about in the past, the houses in this town moved around. Uh, just like they were on wheels, because they did not like to just tear down and do away with. They, they did reuse of them constantly. So the house that was moved from there was moved up here and ended up the little red house over here where we're going to end up the, the whole day at the burn. When Frank Treat uh, came from a, a, a very uh, comfortable farming family. The Treat home was up on Route 42, uh, right about where Barrington is, just just beyond where the water tower is. And uh, it was abandoned, and about maybe 35 or 40 years ago, the city of Aurora, in those days, this was before historic preservation really took hold, uh, the, the fire department used it for fire practice and burned it down. However, uh, George Rettinger was smart enough to have saved the beautiful Adams front door, which is the focal point of the historical society today. And that came from the Amos Treat House, which was the grandfather of the man that built this, uh, this fine brick building. One side was a general store. The other side served as a uh, area where farmers brought milk, farmers brought feed. There was a feed uh, storage area and there was a railroad siding that ran right up to the back of the building so that the uh, cars could be loaded right into the, into the storefront itself. There was, at one time, a parapet up across the top, but that has gone with years. But we're just very happy to see that one of our old buildings has been very well cared for and uh, see it still being used as a, as a commercial building today. Now, the barn is probably, again, about 1910, 1915. It was an ice house. It was an ice house for, uh, for this, and we're, again, happy to see it being maintained, because we, a few years ago, we were very concerned that uh, it might uh, just crumble to pieces. But they now have done some work on it, and they are preserving that, too. This, of course, the whole district now, the whole area here is, is the historic district, and it is under the protection of the Aurora Landmark Commission. About 1910-15, Frank Treat uh, had a little competition come to town, and that was in the form of a man by the name of Albert Bentley Hurd, who uh, was a descendant of the early families of town, and uh, he, he decided he'd put up uh, uh, a little competition across the street. His uh, shop was more, however, for the sale of stoves and, and uh, farm machinery, uh, as opposed to this being more of a general store. After her uh, treat died, uh, the store became uh, a drugstore, and many, again, residents that have been here for 30, 30 plus years can remember when uh, Rick Mattmuller's drugstore was in, was in this building. Next door to the uh, Heard shop was the Aurora House. This was a, a, a hotel for the station district. The center had a hotel, uh, which is now Mario's, 
This was the hotel for the station district. And most of the pictures you see in either Aurora from the Founding to the Flood book or any of the other early uh, books on the put out by the Historical Society, there are pictures of this house. And it had a porch that went all the way across the front. So it, it hardly is recognizable today. But it stands, it's been here again since about the turn of the century uh, and was noted for its uh, fine food. Uh, and a lot of people would get on the train, come out, and those that didn't stop at Jaga Lake, uh, they would come out to Aurora, have their Sunday lunches here, and then get back on the train and go into town. At one point, there were as many, I believe, as eight trains that came through here picking up passengers a day. built in 1868 by Charles Russell. Charlie Russell was a Civil War veteran, moved to Aurora after uh, the Civil War and became a store owner. He was the interim store owner of uh, what is now the, Fra the what, what was the Frank Treat store. He married uh, Sylvia Pease, uh, an early Aurora family connected uh, with uh, the Pises and uh, the Herds and the Sheldons again, uh, married into the early families. Uh, his brother, Wilson Russell, also a Civil War veteran, came to town also. Wilson married the uh, uh, daughter of the Miller Milling family, not, and that's not a last name, it was the Howard family, and we'll talk about him when we go across the street, but. This uh, should have maybe at one time been called Russellville because the Russells were the, were the movers and shakers down here in the 1860s up through the turn of the century. And this was Charlie Russell's house. It was he that moved the house that is now the Burns house up the hill to become the shop and then finally across the street. Uh, it was he who owned the hotel. It was he who built the little house uh, that's a catty corner across here, uh, where the first telephone exchange in the, in the city of Aurora uh, was first located. And the story of that is exciting because uh, they sort of had a, a ersatz one. They ran wires from fence post to fence post to fence post to fence post. And of course, it was just a single line. And the two maiden sisters, one a school teacher and one uh, a maiden lady that just was at home, uh, knew everything that was going on in town, of course, because everything came through their house with open wires and they could, they could uh, listen in on everything so that that early uh, telephone system was, uh, w was kind of interesting. Hi, Betsy. Hi, Betsy. <laughs> you want to join us? <laughs> the house is, is uh, gothic, pure gothic revival country, one of, the, one of the really beautiful houses in Aurora, and uh, is being obviously very well maintained, and we are we're so proud uh, that it has been maintained this way for so long. But it shows the, the, a very high style uh, of person, because that's what Charlie Russell was. And we have some wonderful photographs taken again in the late, maybe 1890s, of this whole property, and, and uh, it has not changed a great deal, as a matter of fact. So let's go on now, on down. The Martin Eggleston house, and this is one of the purest, quote unquote, houses that we have left in, in the town. Not a great deal has been done to this house from the time it was built, probably in the eight, early 1830s. The sides, some of the windows on the sides have been changed, but it is typical of what the common, ordin ordinary citizen in Aurora would have built for himself. And if you go around and look beyond porches that have been added around town and things like that, you will see a lot of houses that have this same basic design. This was the, uh, this was the, the, the house that everybody had the plans for. And uh, this one, however, has been very, very, very much let alone. And it's, it's so great that it has. Martin Eggleston was the last of a family of seven boys and girls that came out with their father
from Middletown, Massachusetts, uh, Middlefield, Massachusetts. And he was the last of the family to come. He arrived around 1812 uh, and probably put up uh, some sort of a, a log house first. And then later, uh, when he got himself established, ended up building this. It's very difficult to exactly date these houses because unless there was a diary kept. This is a house uh, that was built by the Heard brothers. Uh, Elisha and Frank, uh, their father Hobson Heard, I think many of you have been on this talk, but we're going to talk about Hobson Heard. He was the storekeeper and the financier of this town uh, from his settlement days in 1813 up until his death in the 18, uh, late 1860s. Uh, and because of his miserly ways and his foreclosing on uh, so many of the people he had lent money to, he owned uh, probably three quarters of the town at the time of his death. Uh, but this was one of the house that, houses that uh, his sons, Elisha and Frank, built for their workers. Uh, uh, they, had, they, had, they ran part of the mill down here. And uh, this was one of the, mi the mill keeper's house. And they built a very fine Gothic house for them. There had been a house here before this uh, that burned. But uh, this one dates to uh, the 1870s. originally uh, back about 10 years ago when a great deal of work was being done on this house we got into the second floor and uh, they were really working on it uh, in in earnest and we found that the original house the whole uh, positioning of it uh, was north was north south the little part to the left of the house is the old part of the house and the ridge pole ran that direction, and they completely changed the ridge pole. And uh, when we got into the basement, the foundations in the basement show the evidence of probably what was a uh, cooking fireplace and a large, the, the, what would have been in the cabin, in a cabin, uh, or again, uh, an earlier house than most of these others. And it's uh, the famous flood of 1913. I say famous flood uh, for Aurora. Um, Elac and Baldwin's mill was the, on the other side of the river, right down at the river bed. Uh, the Bill Dam and, and Race had been built by Chauncey Eggleston and Ebenezer Sheldon early on. They seeing the also the commercial possibilities of the water power coming through here. On that side of the road, down in the valley here, there were three different buildings of uh, commercial out. There was a shoemaker, a chair uh, maker shop, uh, and a uh, tannery. And when we cross the street, we'll look more uh, at the tannery area. The On this side, there was a factory uh, over on this side, right at the foot of the hill, uh, supposedly where they made uh, violins. Uh, that was uh, one of the people there that, that was instrumental in that. There were the Preston brothers and then also uh, Joseph Skinner, who was the noted violinist uh, and uh, person in, in great demand to play at, at uh, parties and things. At, coming from Mandaway over to Aurora. The two towns were very, very inter uh, interconnected by the same t settlers from the same area in Connecticut. The elders come into town, uh, Edward and Samuel. They came and bought out Eliakim Baldwin. They ran the mill. They turned the mill into, instead of a, a uh, grinding mill, they turned it into a mill for uh, a fulling mill where people would bring in uh, cloth or sheep uh, wool and that they would they would prepare it then for for market so it was constantly in use there uh, and Elikan and Baldwin would take a tree or they would bring them into the sawmill and he would then run it through the saw and as you made a square out of a, a tree 
Those pieces that were cut off were called slabs. I don't know. I don't know who lives here. This is similar to what? Oh. No. When you are up there, you can hardly see. Early on, the tannery was in this area, and tanning hides, you needed great vats of water. And what they would do, they did not run it out of the river. There were streams and springs up in these hills, and they built troughs, wooden troughs, on great huge legs, and troughed the water down into the, uh, into the vats uh, for the tanning. And of course, what was the uh, original business out here was, was dairy. You have cows, the cows die, you have hides, and you take them to the tannery. Right next door was the shoe, uh, was the shoemaker and the, and the boot maker. Uh, this is this is the symbiotic relationship of all of these various things in uh, in the early days. But uh, it's said that the children in the winter would uh, relish when it, the winter came that these troughs would freeze, and they'd use them for slides and slide down them uh, once, once they froze. But I'm afraid. Well, not having sandpaper, that might have been a little bit dangerous. But <laughs> uh, down on this side was the herd cheese factory, probably up at the end, beyond the turn where you, what, what you can see is mowed, uh, is where the herd cheese factory was. And uh, Mrs. Frank Hurd, uh, this is one of the other articles that appeared after the flood, was that the uh, the railroad company was sued by Mrs. Hurd for the loss of the buildings in the cheese factory. Uh, she, they, uh, she was blaming, obviously, the railroad company for not maintaining that uh, uh, trestle correctly. Uh, the, as I say, they were, and stores were not huge buildings in the middle uh, 19th century. They were generally one or two rooms and fairly small com in, uh, by modern standards. So you could have three buildings right here uh, working as, as stores side by side. Uh, we have, if any of you have the uh, Aurora from the Founding to the Flood book, and I'm not doing a plug for it really, but uh, in the back are three very finely written uh, monographs. One is, is about this area right here, and it it was written by a man by the name of Bradley Hawkins, and he was born in a house that stood probably where those trees are right there. And uh, He wrote this just before the turn of the century. He was uh, correcting some people, as a matter of fact, that had done some, had written some uh, history before, and he said, no, this wasn't exactly right. I'll tell it to you the way it really was. Uh, and uh, it's a wonderfully, wonderfully detailed history of where we're standing. and. Uh, I, I commend it to you. Uh, it's wonderfully written, very flowery Victorian language, but again, it, it really gives you a true picture of what life was right here, where we're standing today. The original bridge, or the first metal bridge, I can't say the original bridge, but the first metal bridge came across at an angle here, rather than straight the way it does now. It angled to go across the stream in a different way. And in the early pictures, uh, you can see that uh, very, very plainly. The road came down, took a little turn to the right, then it crossed the bridge, and then it turned. It had a little, a little zigzag in it. The river, even today, you can see, is running pretty, pretty fast. Slab City. Now I'm going to tell you why it became known as Howardville. Uh, the original purchaser of this piece of property on the west side of the river was a man by the name of Septimus Witter. He too was a miller, obviously drawn to the water power, and he put up a sawmill back in here, uh, further back of that fence right there, right on the river. The river comes back, takes a large bow to the west right there, and then goes on, oh, maybe down to about where the railroad is, and then it makes another turn uh, north. Witter sold the house to, uh, and, the, and the mill, to a man by the name of Freeman Howard. And Freeman Howard was Aurora's premier miller. He had this mill, 
He eventually built a second mill across the river. That was a one, uh, this was a grist mill, that was a sawmill. He then went up and saw the possibilities up at Centerville, which is up on Crackle Road, and he built a mill up there. And there's the wonderful story of his mill up there burning, uh, which was a great tragedy to the town. And we have a document in the Historical Society files where the townspeople got together and offered it two days labor or five sheep skins and things like that in order to come and help Freeman Howard rebuild that mill. And the story of when he rebuilt the mill up at, at Centerville, and it was a great tall mill that he climbed up to the top beam of this mill with the river down at the, at the bottom and took a jug of whiskey and quaffed it off and then dropped the jug down and to break on the bottom of the rocks on the bottom. I don't know how true that is, but that, that's the story that went around. But he had a son, Chester, who inherited all the property. And Chester didn't like the old common house that they lived in here. So he contracted, evidently he'd gone to Western New York State on a trip or something, and he happened to see a style of house, very unusual in Ohio, but very often found in Western New York State. And that's the cobblestone uh, type of house. The, this is probably the best known house in the city of Aurora. It's in every book on Ohio architecture that, that has been published to date. Uh, it's just a, we are so fortunate to have it. The lentils and the, the lentils uh, on the windows and on the doors, etc., are iron. The walls are something like 13 inches thick. Um, and it has been well maintained through the years uh, and is now it's obviously still in loving, loving hands, thank goodness. The cobblestones on the front are, ex are extended. In other words, you can see the curvatures on them. On the back here, they're just flat and, and, uh, and set in. But uh, this was the, uh, the Chester Howard house, uh, and it was lived in. Uh, Chester Howard's daughter married uh, Wilson Russell, who was Charlie Russell's brother from up in Joga County came down here and it was lived in uh, un well into the 1900s by descendants of the family. Then it, then it uh, uh, had been sold out, but again, to people that loved it and uh, have cared for it greatly. And we are so, so pleased to have this. This house is on the National Register of Historic Places uh, and also the uh, HABS, the Historic American Building Survey that was done in the 19. 30s to uh, put architects to work. They went around the, town, uh, the uh, country uh, drawing fine representative uh, architectural houses. This is one of them from Aurora. I think Aurora had four that were done, this being one of them and probably the most famous. Oh, those. And the, what do you mean by whey sugar? W H E Y, the uh, leftover from curds the and whey. Oh, okay. And these boilers were were created out somewhere and brought out here, and the, it it did not work, and uh, it, the the operation went bust. But the, and they were split apart and they were used as water. <laughs> Many of the cobblestone houses in Western New York State. He was the. Yeah. Evidently, Ken says that he's had visitors come in who are descendants of M. Smith. Uh, I, 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 he made himself. If I own the house, I wouldn't have the That's right. Yeah. And they. Uh, uh, Seabury Ford, who was one of our, our real, again, monuments around town, great man, and I have many out, pleasant hours sitting and talking to him and interviewing him and writing down. That's where a lot of the stories come from, because he lived here all his life, and he tells a story and he pre proves it with a deed. The deed to that land uh, deeds the property 
and the house and the outhouse, half of the outhouse. The outhouse sat right on the property line. Half of it was uh, in the next uh, piece of person's piece of property, and there were two doors, and it, it was a two-holer. So, <laughs> but it needed half of the outhouse. Which how, was, how to meet, how to meet your neighbor? That's just exactly right. Back to back. Huh? And, and I was telling them about the house where we're sitting. This house has been in three different locations in this area. This is the third, and it was where. Johnny McDonald uh, grew up as a boy. Yeah, yeah. And the house next door was the first constable. Was that Sam Miller? Sam Miller. And he lived right over there. Well, then you're home. That's right. Well, I lived here over 60 years ago in this house. Oh, did you, Jane? I didn't know that. I, we, lived, we rented from Johnny McDonald. Oh, over 60 years ago. We lived downstairs, of course, and then my aunt and uncle lived upstairs, so I don't know when it became a two-family house. It's been built in sections. It's four, Jim, three or four sections. Four sections. Two years ago, we made it back into a two-family house. Two family house. <laughs> then it was so a one-family house. And it sat back here, and Treek spent <coughs> a lifetime selling his property off. We've spent a lifetime buying it all buying back. It all back. <laughs> so we have about uh, 30 plus acres. Back here. Over the yard. And, and uh, the biggest claim to fame there is uh, <laughs> as a kid when I came out from Cleveland, we went swimming down here in the river, and that used to be BAB. I don't know if you know what BAB stands for, but we'll stop right there. <laughs> okay. So we bought BAB, I can and, and I thought to myself, how many people get an opportunity to do this? And uh, so we've had a lot of fun. Uh, Curtis is, and Mitch, Mitchell's a, a little guy. He's the one that makes a little noise. He's autistic. And he's great happy. Kid. And he's happy. 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 He's so happy. Glad to be a company. He likes company. I'm very excited that you're and all here. Curtis is his brother. Curtis is around here somewhere. And so we spent a lot of time down in the woods. Interestingly enough, back years ago, Seabury Ford uh, talked to the Historical Society and uh, one of our other charter members. Uh, lady that's now in a, in a nursing home out in Elyria, who spent her summers out here, uh, came and she said, I've come just to keep Seabury Ford from telling stories about watching us girls do what you did down in the river down here at the swimming hole. Uh, so even, uh, it wasn't limited to the boys, it was uh, the, the girls also evidently slipped away and did a little skinny dipping in the river. Apparently this was all that they had uh, a lot of orchards, you didn't have the wooded area. And there's a lot of old uh, orchard apple trees in through here. And this building that across from, the, I don't know if you check that, the building next to the Brown's own store there, that building used to sit down on a pond that we had. And they used to call it Slaughter Lake on each pond. But they called it, and they made ice there. There was an ice house. They had an ice house, and then they also uh, apparently uh, butchered the meat. Yeah. I didn't know that they had moved back into the new stuff. So that I didn't know. It's nice to see that they're finally doing some work out there. Oh, yeah, doing some work. Well, there used to be a lot of bottles found. Yeah. Um, I had told you that uh, prior to um, the coming of the railroads, most of the settlers were all New England uh, origins. Once the railroads came through,